Welcome to 50 Turns of Gong Soon Zon's campaign for Total War Three Kingdoms, the Iron Fish General, the White Horse of the North. You'll notice his campaign is labeled as a normal difficulty, and I'd say that's fairly accurate. He gets additional reinforcement range, an additional bonus to shock cavalry charge, which considering he gets unique white horse cavalry units that are shock cavalry as well as horse archers, that makes perfect sense for him. When you start up the campaign, you obviously get a lovely intro cinematic, which we'll be skipping here because no time. Instead, you get to hear the lovely dulcet tones of Gong Soon Zan himself. Not bad considering. Now, I did try out the Chinese voiceover options. It sounds pretty good. I'm just a lazy American who doesn't want to have to read the entire time. But I will point out that in battle, when someone shouts out something important, like, you know, hey, I'm being attacked, it is useful to hear that in English. He of the White Horse Cavalry begins in the far north of China, and your first mission is just like every other. Tutorial battle mission where you fight a nearby weakened army, which, on this case, belongs to the Han Empire. Checking my graphics settings, you'll notice I'm able to run pretty much everything on higher ultra with a GTX 1070 and an i7 processor, including extreme unit size, which I see I even put a warning label next to. The battle itself shakes out about like you'd expect. You'll notice you have overwhelming superiority at the beginning and can even auto resolve for victory, but that's lame, so we didn't do that. In game, we're using the romance mode color configuration, which is extra bright and snazzy. Uh, we do have TAA as well as the sharpening filter on, which if you plan to use TAA, you definitely need to do. Temporal anti-aliasing by itself tends to make things look a little blurry. The battle itself opened with me sending Gong Soon Zan and his cavalry over to the flank and sending my infantry down the center. Now the opposing general, Zhao Xin, decided to duel Zhao Yun, which was the last mistake he was ever going to make in this battle. One thing I do want to make sure to point out is the range of the archers in this game. Previously in Total War games, they feel a bit short, but in this one, these arrows start to fly a long way in advance, and you have to use the cavalry as a hard counter to them. To try and prevent me from doing just that, the AI sent their cavalry to counter my own, but these are white horse cavalry, led by Gong Sun Zan. Having finished mopping the floor with the enemy general, my infantry was free to begin circling around and mopping up any survivors. I sent Gong Sun there to finish off the archers and brought my cavalry from behind for a lovely hammer and anvil charge, which is how you'll be spending most of your time as Gong Soon Zan as he is a cavalry focused lord. The battle itself ended in a decisive victory, with most of the kills not surprisingly being racked up by the cavalry. From there, my basic quest battles encouraged me to take the nearby iron mine and thus complete my commandery. One auto-resolve battle later, and I now own an entire province. Which, as it's early game and I intended to keep it, there was no real reason not to just occupy. Pleased with my progress as an up-and-coming lord, it then instead turns me to construction basics. You know, things like just improve a building. Not exactly high-level stuff. The building system for Total War Three Kingdoms is an interesting cross between Shogun II and Thrones of Britannia, with a primary building that uh, controls the settlement with additional little small ones that can be diversified, and small towns counting as resources. You'll notice most of the building types are actually locked right now. They require some type of research to actually be built beforehand, which is uh, found in the technology tree. I ended up focusing on mainly the military branch, as Gong Soon Zan is a militaristic society and gets a special building on that chain that unlocks not only his White Horse Cavalry, but a building that provides additional income as well as public order. The tree itself just has so many nodes on it, it can be somewhat overwhelming at times, so it was nice that this lord had a very clear path forward. The reward for doing this was a bit of money to build my army with, and the breadcrumbing of quests continue to encourage me to expand my empire and continue building out further. With only one small city left to complete my province, the obvious route was to the trade port to my east, and as it was held by a Han Empire dog, well, he can frankly die like one. But the game itself had other plans, on the very but the game itself had other plans, and when I pressed in turn, the Yellow Turban Rebellion faction on my western border instead decided to declare war on me, which I apparently only have the option to acknowledge. I wish there was acknowledge an insult. Frankly, headbands are so 1980s. As usual, the best laid plans of mice and men have come to nothing, so I had to about face my army and march them west, 
with extreme speed. But I knew that no matter how bad things got, I still had my vassal and military ally Gong Sun Du to help support me because blood runs thicker than water. After a winter of recruitment and resupplying, I start heading west because the best defense is a good offense and immediately find Li Yu guarding the nearby major city. Now, I look at my forces and decide his strategist archer style is no match for my white horse cavalry kung fu. My god, that was a bad accent. I keep that in reserve just for like really epic moments. Hoping to bait him out of his city, I park my army on his border and find there's not a raiding stance. Possibly this is unlocked in the technology tree, but I did not see it. The next turn though, it proved superfluous as Zhang Yan declared war on Lu Yu on his western frontier. Now pinched between two different forces, there was no reason not to press my attack. But all my warmongering had upset my own troops and I now had a negative 10 public order penalty because apparently you shouldn't flog a dead horse. Hoping to use the tried and true Empire Total War strategy, I made for his small cities to try and take away his resources and starve him out. Guessing my intentions, Li Yu offered me peace, but to attain it, I would first have to trade him my iron mine. So that wasn't going to happen. And at this point, the Donger died back in Chang'an, which meant the Han Empire was no longer a threat to be concerned about. But Li Yu had used the distraction as an opportunity to bugger off and get out of my way. So there's no reason not to pick up the city that he left behind. This meant taking my third settlement and also completing my most recent objective. Then I was given one to send the character on assignment. I assumed that meant possibly take a lord out of my army and deploy him like an agent in Warhammer or in the previous Total War titles. But in fact, after way too much time, I found a single button in the bottom left hand corner. Clicking it brings up the available characters in your faction and shows you the added benefits that you can get by deploying them for a specific task with added benefits to public order or production or even income based on their specialization. And it changes of who's available depending on what you wanna do there. All this governing had allowed Gong Soon Zan to level up, so I invested in a furious roar and doubled down on what he's good at, instinct. Knowing that my enemy was still on my doorstep and in control of much needed horse pastures, I decided to press the attack, only to meet the new Dong Zhuo, who apparently was as deluded as his predecessor. A quick check of my map determined that not only is he not near me, he wants a regular payment just for peace, so as he's not a threat, that's not going to happen. But my pressing fight against Li Yu could wait no longer, and as it was too close to auto-resolve, time had come to step in and do it myself. Yet again, he had a copious number of archers, and my cavalry were itching to do their best impression of the stallion that mounts the world. But it turns out this battle would literally be one that's uphill, and when I tried to give myself better odds by offering a duel, well, the other side rejected it like the craven dogs that they are. So I moved my cavalry to the flanks and moved my troops in. But the enemy AI countered by moving their cavalry that way, so I had no choice but to commit my heroes to the action. As the battle for the flanks continued, my main battle line finally made it to the fight, but there weren't enough of them to completely encircle them and their, and their archers fell back to continue firing and right into the trap set by Gong Soon Zan. But even completely encircled, the lines did not instantly break. In romance mode, the heroes really are the backbones of the army, always are the last units to break, sometimes taking two or three minutes to kill just themselves. And if they're a commander type unit, the nearby troops become basically unbreakable, even when rear charged by cavalry and infantry. Thankfully, Gong Sun Zan has that morale debuffing roar. The game counted as a close victory, but a victory is still a victory. So we'll take it. Seeing the power of archers in the enemy army, I decided it was time to add my own strategist. So I quite, so I, so I searched for one that added harmony to the rest of my army, denoted here by a green checkbox, and then recruited him in. To a horse-based lord like Gong Soon Zan, the pastures are important, so they got upgraded first, and then I went around from town to town and did a little maintenance. You'll notice that any town with upgrade has a bouncing up and down arrow on it, telling you instantly if you can do something. Now, unlike previous Total War games, 
only one building can be building or improved at a time in each province. So you have to think ahead of time about which one you want to do first. With Li Yu on his back foot, there was no reason not to continue taking his territory. And on a resolve later, another province is mine. This destroyed Li Yu and opened up the first real quest chain for Gong Sun San which had me destroying Yun Shao's faction, who I hadn't even met yet, so it sounded a bit presumptive, but it is historical, although in this case, Gong Sun San actually lost. But hey, we're not about to bow to the whims of history on my campaign. Now relatively safe, my eyes again turn to that port on my far eastern front. Who should appear but Zhang Yan, who wanted military access in trading for regular food and some ancillaries. So that was a no, you don't just let a bandit worm across your lands and pay him to do it. My vassal Gong Sun Du wanted the same thing, but as he'd always been loyal to me, I saw no reason not to allow it. But worried that he might take the port before I could, I did start heading to eastwards, only to find that Zhang Yan did in fact have an ulterior motive. So I cursed his sudden yet inevitable betrayal and prepared for war again. But the lost income from my missing port was beginning to hurt me, so I recruited my son, Gong Sun Shu, and decided to make a small second army to see if I could sneak in and take it from the local garrison. But as he was new to this whole process, I did give him my strategist to ensure an easy victory. Leaving Gong Sun Du to muster his troops, I headed west in a march stance to try and intercept Zhang Yan before he could do any damage, only to be approached again by Dong Min, who somehow found a way to make his previous deal even worse, this time requiring I become a vassal. So that was a hard pass. As I crossed the northern plains, I took a moment to examine what I had picked up in my spoils of battle and found a red stallion, which worked perfectly with Gong Sun Zan's abilities. It's also cool to note that if you switch around weapons or armor here, it does show up in the campaign map. Using Force March, I arrived just ahead of Zhang Yan's army, who quickly disappeared off the map, because he's a sneaky, sneaky, stinking bandit. As this meant he'd be taking the fight to me, I decided to pad out the rest of my army, but found my lack of a constant revenue stream was hampering me significantly. Zhang Yan was not going to give me an opportunity to fix the problem, and attacked first. With three gates facing the enemy, I had to play to my strength, so I moved Gong Sun Zan and his White Horse Cavalry out to meet the enemy but they would not be baited and they kept their archers fully covered. But when he sent a probing force of Black Mountain Outlaws to try and test my defenses, I showed them that he had to respect the power of Gong Sun Zong. But with my cavalry engaged, the rest of Zhang Yan's army decide it was time to begin assaulting the gate. I had assumed there may be a possible three-pronged assault and left troops on the far left, center, and right, but seeing now that they were dedicating to an assault on the right flank, I began repositioning my troops from the middle and had to hope for the best. No sooner had I begun repositioning than the left flank decided it was the perfect time to attack. I knew I had to finish this fight quickly and use my cavalry to punch through them. Unfortunately, my gate defenders had already fallen back inside the city. Thankfully, my reserve troops were there to stop them. At this point, the battle became a ticking clock. Could I finish off the assault on the right gate fast enough to be able to stop the assault on the left gate? Again, Zhao Yun and Gong Sun Zan showed their worth, single-handedly capturing it for themselves. And by the time they arrived at the eastern gate, the only man left standing was Zhong Yan himself. But our brave men needed heroic support to take him down. He was not going without a fight. Considering the whole thing could have gone much better, I learned a valuable lesson about keeping my troops in reserve to respond to enemy movements. It was also the first time I'd ever captured an enemy in battle, and considering his stats, I chose to employ him. Though apparently employing and recruiting are two different things, and my meager income could not actually support him in my armies. To take out my frustrations, I decided to finish off Zhang Yan, only to have him Benny Hill the way out of my province. As a consolation, the esteemed Liu Bei liked my actions and introduced himself as a friend. With the war in the west going swimmingly, it was time to go ahead and take that port in the east, and as it was clearly unguarded, hey, easy pickings. Assuming that Zhang Yan's army was even more battered than mine, I went ahead and advanced into his territory and decided to punish him for his insolence. But he had the last laugh by advancing back into my territory and causing me to chase him around for three turns like a terrifying game of cat and mouse. At the same time, my continued trade improved relations with Zhao Yun, who I knew would prove a powerful ally if I ever had to fight his brother. As I advanced my eastern army to join my western, Zhang Yan tried to sue for peace, but as there was no benefit to me, he was going to have to eat some humble pie for his nonsense. His purpose served, Gong Sun Shu was sent back to the palace to continue to do whatever it is that he does. First time I ever clicked on him, he said the words, Summon the merchants, I will browse their goods. 
which I heard as summon the virgins, I will browse their goods, which is a really weird thing to say the first time you meet someone. The war was going well, and it was just a matter of time before I won, but then my vassal and ally decided to betray me. Personally, I suspect the workings of South South, but I can't prove it. I responded by bolstering my treasury and closing a trade deal with my nearest neighbor, Kong Rong. Then it was time to humble myself and accept Chong Gan's surrender. His significant contribution to my war effort eased my pain. Dong Min got involved by offering to make me a vassal. Again. Some people just never learn. Gong Sun Du's surprise attack on my trade port, coupled with a failed defense of it, meant that I started this campaign off on my back foot. Knowing that this was a full stack army I was facing, I paused in my capital to recruit my maximum number of units, and finished out the research on the military tech tree. My patience was rewarded when Kong Rong suggested we form a coalition to fight the barbarians of the north. Wanting to join the cool kids, Han Fu, my southern neighbor, also asked to join. Kong Rong disagreed and asked him to remove his My Little Pony sticker from the clubhouse. As we marched north, our little coalition picked up steam when Liu Bei also asked to join, but Kong Rong rejected again, citing too many dicks on the dance floor. At this point, I was beginning to question Kong Rong's taste and wondered if I, in fact, had joined the lame club. When who should appear but Yun Shao himself, who just wanted peace with me. I mean, it's not historical, but I mean, can you blame the guy? I guess we're awesome. This in turn encouraged Zhang Yan to also seek peace, not wanting to anger the awesome giants. Figuring that Gong Soon Du would continue to protect the valuable port resource, I decided to head north and try and take out his smaller cities. Liu Bei agreed with my plan and decided to let me know that he wouldn't backdoor me, especially as Gong Soon Du hadn't even given me the courtesy of a reach around. So in the dead of winter, I attacked, only to discover his army was not in the port. It was in fact on the northern mine. At this point, there was nothing for it, so into the fight we went. I drew my main army up in a gap in the trees to give plenty of line of sight for my archers in the trebuchet, then deployed my cavalry to the right wing. The AI responded by deploying their cavalry to my left, which I then tried to respond with with infantry. But cavalry in this game is much, much faster than infantry. And much like the lookout on the Titanic, all I could do was sit and watch, as my best laid orders could not be relayed fast enough to actually prevent an oncoming disaster. I wheeled Gong Soon Zan around and then dedicated Captain Purple to guarding the rear. The enemy general then challenged Gong Soon Zan to a duel. He's not exactly built for it, but I needed any help I could get and was willing to risk the outcome. I needn't have been worried though, as his health bar dropped in all of about 15 seconds. With the enemy commander out of the way, my own infantry were still in a pretty solid battle, so I began to deploy my archers to the rear and sides and move my cavalry to try and get them from behind. Even with archers firing directly into their flanks, they still were not breaking because some of their generals and lords were still alive. And even though I wanted to duel Gong Sun Du, he wasn't willing to risk another loss. But as my White Horse cavalry came around the edge of their army, they all began to rout, and whatever chance he may have had for victory slipped away. This battle showed me again just how important mobility is in Three Kingdoms. Even after his resounding defeat, Gong Sun Du had the audacity to dare ask for peace. He was rejected. But while I retook my port in the south, he continued his reputation for sneakery and took me completely unawares. This is one of those classic fights that you never want to fight. Technically, it's a garrison against a bunch of half-strength recently mustered troops. I mean, it's winnable, but I mean, it's not exactly ideal. But as there's a chance, it's a chance I needed to take. Learning from last time, I decided to only guard two of the three entrances into the camp. They didn't have enough enemy units to try for more than that, and then put my cavalry on the wing and waited for them to come in. As they plunged in through the pass, I sent my cavalry around behind and aimed for their archers. Once they were out of the way, it was a simple matter of cycle charging into the rear of the enemy until they gave up or my line broke. The problem was they had a true lord leading their army, and it didn't matter how many men I threw at it, this guy was not going to die. Eventually, when they were the only two units left on the battlefield, they finally gave up and ran, and ended up being captured and killed by my garrison units, resulting in this campaign's first heroic victory. Yay. The next turn brought my main army to his capital city, and after an auto-resolved battle, Gong Soon Du ceased to exist. But my jubilation was short-lived, as on my next turn, my good friend Yun Shao vassalized my nearest neighbor, 
who then asked him to declare war on me, and my supposed friend Kong Rong would only help me if I agreed to give him the port that I'd just fought the Tay. So I goat roped Liu Bei into attacking the vassal, which in turn made Yun Shao declare war on him, and then Yuan Shu attacked Yuan Shao now that he's occupied attacking me, and the north turned into an endless war zone on my last turn. To top it all off, Dong Min still wants me to be a vassal. Needless to say, it's a lot going on for turn 50, and I can't wait for turn 51, which unfortunately I can't show you today. But that's alright, because Three Kingdoms Total War comes out on May 23rd. So, thanks for watching, and vote on which 50 turns you'd like to see next below.